Welcome to Get Your Rocks Off with Mick Wall, the world's leading rock and metal writer. Each fortnight, Mick will unpack rock and roll stories, stories that you probably won't find in print. So pour yourself a Jack and Coke and get ready to get your rocks off. So Mick, last time we spoke in part one of the Mick Wall story, we basically left it at you being at a crossroads between writing for Time Out magazine or writing for Kerrang. I imagine that was a, a difficult decision, but we all know how, how it played out. Yeah. Well, Time Out uh, was a very, very cool magazine. And, um, you know, I would have, at the time, that would have been very, that would have suited me very nicely. Mm-hmm. The trouble with the very, very cool magazines is that everybody wants to write for them. And although I had friends there uh, and there was um, a trickle of work, it, it, it was prestigious, but it wasn't enough to uh, give me a living. Sure. And uh, Kerrang! at that time, as it kind of remained, um, but uh, was mostly, you know, kids that were music enthusiasts. They were first and foremost heavy metal fans. Um, and, uh, and so it was, it was, it, I'm not going to say a fanzine, but it was very, very uh, coming from a very big fan point of view. It wasn't overly critical, mm-hmm. um, had a great deal of humor and heart because these people really did love and know about the stuff they were covering. But I, it was like a football team that lacked a star player and, um, <laughs> You know, a football team that, that 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 was one division below the the Premiership. You know, the the, the top division. So, so does that and make you the uh, the George, the proverbial George Best, Mick, when you join Kerrang? That makes me the proverbial George Best. <laughs> Although, um, I mean, George Best to carry that analogy. George Best was seventeen when he made his debut. Uh, I was a bit more like you know that star player you buy. Um, in his mid twenties, when he's mm. already proved himself, but maybe he got a fine uh, for something or fell out with someone, and he had right. to leave. So a bit like Cristiano Ronaldo joining Real Madrid <coughs> after falling yeah, out with or, Alex Ferguson. Um, <laughs> yeah, or, or Eric Cantona, I think. Um, you Indeed, know, joining Man United when everybody else had just had enough of him. I mean, that was very much me, mm. and I saw that. Um, and I just weighed up the possibilities and just what would be more fun, what would give me more money. And Kerrang, it just so happened that at, at that moment, coincidentally, Jeff Barton, who'd been uh, my reviews editor on Sounds magazine, going back to when I wrote for them, it just so happened that um, uh, Kerrang had gone from this one off to this monthly to this thing that came out every two weeks eventually it would go to weekly it was two weeks when i got there and they had just made jeff the new editor um because it was becoming much more professional and they needed that kind of um you know they needed that that sort of person to run the ship and um he'd been there about a week and he and i just had my second piece published and he just said rang me up and asked me to go for a drink and he just said look um if you come and do this, you know, really give it a go. Uh, his actual words were the sky's the limit because mm. um, we don't have any, you know, real good writers. We have really good enthusiastic people that are funny, but uh, uh, you know, there's no one that kind of breaks out of that that can write. Um, so I was obviously pleased and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm the guy, I'm the guy. <laughs> so um, I was the guy for about six weeks and then I had a bad breakup with <laughs> my girlfriend and I vanished for about three months. And when I came yeah. back, I was like, you said the sky was the limit. He said, yeah. And then you vanished for three months. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, give us another chance, you know. And um, so he gave me another chance and, and I just threw myself into it. And they were really magical days on Kerrang! 1984, 1985. 
uh, when it was uh, used to come out every two weeks, you, you know, you would have two weeks to, to make that magazine fantastic. And there was only a very, very small crew that worked on it. Um, and, and we just put a lot of love into it. Uh, and and I'd have to I'd have to be able to show you an old issue to show you what I mean. But this is pre computers. Everything is done by hand. The old the old design method with tracing paper and pens and projectors and um, and uh, it, it, we just had that extra little bit of headspace where we would add tiny things, hand draw. Uh, little squiggles and stuff you wouldn't it was like you know that that great thing about the simpsons where it works on different levels yeah if you go into the minutiae you go oh oh you know and um i mean for instance we had uh uh we had someone doing a column which we called wimp wire um uh, and that was the, the covering the melodic rock scene uh, and so a we called it wimp wire which which just made us laugh you know <laughs> But then every, you wouldn't notice, some people never notice at all, but that column, those two pages, every issue, down one side, the designer used to hand draw a little mouse eating cheese right at the bottom right-hand corner. <laughs> and then at the top right-hand corner, there was a guillotine. And each issue, it would get a tiny bit lower, tiny bit lower. And then eventually came the day when it chopped the mouse's head off. Um, <laughs> that was and, a Kerrang's Mad Magazine fold-out moment. Absolutely. But there were loads of things like that. There was a gossip column called View from the Bar because Kerrang, um, because it was the o at that point, it was the only heavy metal magazine in the world. And uh, heavy metal, as you know, we've discussed before, had no profile whatsoever in the UK, mm. not even in the music press, other than Kerrang. So whenever there was a show on, whether a big show or a club show, usually a small show, because we'd be out every night, but they would just put the whole magazine on the guest list. Um, and it just became, oh, the Kerrang guys are here. And, and um, So just on that, became, Nick... I mean, I know in the 80s, it was a totally different music industry to what it is today. And record companies ultimately had no one else to spend money on other than press. And like you said, Kerrang! were the only game in town, especially in the UK when it came to heavy metal press. And so if there was a tour over in the United States, they'd basically pay you guys to fly out and join the bands on their US legs of the tour and drum up publicity for the UK leg. Uh, I imagine this would have, I mean, you always had a sort of hard, raging sort of lifestyle. Um, I mean, we've already talked about your uh, dabbling with heroin and everything else, but I imagine your lifestyle would have gone from 10 to 11 in the 80s after you joined Kerrang. Yeah, it did. <clears throat> uh, in ways I, I could not have imagined. Um, it was very freeing as we say these days, because, um, you know, I, I had, I always felt I had the misfortune to begin my writing career uh, just as punk. Um, I think the same month I had my very, very first review published was the same month, Never Mind the Bollocks by the Sex Pistols came out. Mm. And I loved the Sex Pistols. I didn't like The Clash, loved The Damned didn't like the jam you know I, I mean I was I was only 19 so I was into all that stuff but I've been a music fan for a long time and and like I said before my my idea of your know, very big punk thing back in the that, those days was hate America hate any sign of visible sign of success or hippydom or and I'm like oh, no 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 that's what I came in for and, and suddenly catapulting into the world of Kerrang! in the mid-80s was kind of like the next best thing because, because they were all about, you know, let's who is the most successful rock band, who lives the most lavish, outrageous lifestyle, uh, Lemmy, Dio, Ozzy. It was just a world populated by these fantastic characters. And so I was able to finally enjoy uh and 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 celebrate limousines and private planes and chicks and 
Partey, you know, it was like that. I mean, Kerrang itself was, um, when I think back, my God, you know, because it came out every two weeks and because there were literally only four or five of us that were in the office every day, um, we used to, we, I used to share a table with um, Malcolm Dome and a designer, Crusher Jewel, mm -hmm. and we used to uh, have a bottle of mezcal just on the table between us every day every day I was um, gonna ask. <laughs> and then at the end me and crusher would would uh, split the worm you know but mm -hmm. at the same time as this i would turn up to work with six cans of lager uh I, I say turn up to work you know we'd roll in about 11 you know because we'd have been out till two in the morning um and it just was a constant uh constant atmosphere like that yeah the first christmas um all the record companies would send bottles of champagne and christmas mm -hmm. cards was it, and all kinds of stuff was it what kind of champagne man was it top shelf or do you know i i don't know steve because <laughs> you guys didn't drink I'm, champagne <laughs> well we did i mean we did i mean we used to get sent bottles of champagne all the time you know yep. um uh, so I'd, uh, it probably was good stuff because record companies, all they do is they, uh, in those days, they just phone, you know, whoever they normally use to send champagne to their musicians, their artists. Mm -hmm. So it would have been one of those. I'm sure it would have been very good, but it was treated like fucking mouthwash. I mean, we just pop, 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 guzzle, 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 no glasses, no paper cups, just straight down the neck. One for you, bottle for you, bottle for me, you know. Um but, but that's what it was like. I can remember getting the new issue and, and lying in bed at night and reading it and, and laughing so much um, that, you know, I nearly had a fit. Um, uh, the stories were funny. The pictures were funny. But it was the tone. It was all these extra little things we used to throw in, these in-jokes. And it kind of built to fever pitch, you know. Um, uh, and you either kind of got it or you didn't. Yeah. And so how, did, how a, did you go about balancing that with uh, the lifestyle you were living, like the creativity of actually writing good stuff with a good tone that was funny and everything else? Meanwhile, turning up to work at eleven in the morning, hungover from the last night with a with a sixer and getting stuck into some champagne while you're at it. Well, you know, you can do anything in your twenties, can't you? I mean, I, yeah. I mean, uh, I can remember sitting there at the typewriter with the sweat just trickling <laughs> down my back um, uh, and realizing my hands were shaking so much I could barely type. Um, and, and you would run, we were, we, were, we were literally in an office above Covent Garden tube station. And if you looked out of the window, we were on the first floor, if you looked out the window, there were literally two pubs opposite each other on the corner. And um, I would go down to the pub um, and if they needed me, no mobile phones, if they needed me, they'd open a window. Go, Mick, there's so-and-so on the phone. I'm like, oh, tell them I'll be up in a minute, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you just did. I mean, I, 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 I remember sometime about a year into it, I, I had a new girlfriend and I would go visit her and I'd always turn up with lots of beer, you know, and... Um, and she said to me one day, she said, when was the last time you, you didn't have a drink, you know, had a, a day without a drink? And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't think. I mean, I was, I was quite affronted by the question because it had never occurred to me that you might have a day without a drink. Why would you do that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so different times. And um, I, I can remember sitting in L.A. interviewing... I can't even remember the name of the band now. I can picture them. Um, but sitting there and hurting so bad, you know, just my head pounding and the sweat pouring off me while I listened to them telling me how great their new album was, you know. Um, I, I think also because by then I, I'd worked in PR, I'd worked in management, I'd worked with a lot of really famous bands, but I'd worked with them not as a journalist, but as one of the team. Uh, and and you see people that they're, they're just people are just people whether they're in a famous group or whether they're just you know walking down the street people are just people you get used to them real fast and so by the time I got to Kerrang uh, you know a lot I mean Iron Maiden were all my age Def Leppard were all about my age mm. 
Bon Jovi were a tiny bit younger. Guns N' Roses were a tiny bit younger. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like I would have been when I was 18 if I'd met David Bowie or something. You know, I'm now 25, 26, and I'm meeting groups that, you know, I've been in the business longer than they have. I've, I've done yeah. more things than they have. You know, it must have been brilliant to be Iron Maiden in 1984. But would they have known what it was like to ride around in the back of a limo with Thin Lizzy in the late 70s? Mm. No. Would they know what it'd be like to be on a three-day bender with Ozzy? No. I mean, I could go on, you know. Um, so I didn't feel... It, it, I felt like a pig in shit is what I felt like. Um, and I was the biggest pig in the most shit uh, that I could find. And I wasn't married. I had no kids. I'd come out of this bizarre relationship with drugs and with weird women and, and men, not, you know, I mean, friends, weird friends. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was ready, baby. You know, I'm ready to go. What the fuck? And, and I used to write fast. I didn't write for any kind of literary purpose. I wrote to entertain um, uh, and I look back at some of that stuff. Well, very occasionally someone will send me a clipping. I hear the podcast and we did the Donington podcast. People started sending me cuttings of things I wrote from that show. And it's exactly as I described it, these <laughs> short reviews that if you look at them, you can tell basically I was blitzed out of my mind. <laughs> I had no idea what the fuck I was talking about. Um, but, but it was fun. You know, we, we didn't have any strategy. I mean, it, by 1990, Kerrang! got bought by EMAP. And EMAP had Smash Hits, Mojo, Q, uh, Select Magazine, loads of very high-profile music-related magazines. And the first time we went into the office, their publishers came in and wanted to discuss the cover with Jeff, the editor, and they were like, and, and so why, why this cover? Why have you chosen that mm. group? Which demographic are you aiming for? And we, we had no fucking idea what they were talking about. We were going, yeah, but it's Chainsaw Massacre. The album's great. So, I mean, we're just putting them on the cover. And they'd go, well, wouldn't it be better to put, you know, Bon Jovi on the cover? And we go... Yeah, but yeah, and we will when we feel like it. You know, it just we didn't have that head for business. Yeah. And yet the magazine, the popularity rocketed, particularly after it went weekly. I mean, there was a time, I mean, Kerrang started as a tiny one off. One of the reasons we got left alone so long was we, it wasn't considered that we were like on a rolling weekly contract where it could just end at any second. It was never, ever ever launched it had no strategy or marketing it wasn't something they didn't roll it out like a new magazine should be they didn't launch it they didn't promote it it was just a piece of flibbity bibbity dibbity stuff that drunk people did in mm. that weird office in the corner and yet it finally overtook sounds magazine which at one point had been the biggest selling music weekly in the country not only did it overtake it, but by like 90 something or other, they closed sounds down. Uh, Melody Maker, they closed it down. NME, we started to outsell the NME, which was just insane. Um, and then they started launching it around the world. And, and, and by then there was Metal Hammer and loads of different rock related titles. And in America, there were magazines that, tried to do the same thing. There was Faces magazine in New York. I used to do stuff for them. Rip magazine in LA. I used to do stuff for them. But they were all kind of mini-me Kerrang! magazines. And, the, and, and they didn't work in the same way because they thought it was about the music. They thought it was about the groups. They didn't realise that was your base. That was your, that was your baseline. That was your reason to be there. But once you were there, it really wasn't about that stuff at all. It was about the humour, the wit, mm. the knowledge. And you got to know these people. Um, you know, we used to, every single writer and photographer got turned into a kind of a caricature so that the readers could, f they were like, we became like avatars. 
so that when I was writing these stories, it was very much written as if one of the readers was doing that journey. And it was written for them. And it was written to entertain them and make them laugh. And, uh, you know, one of the things that used to be said about me was, you know, as, as a criticism was, um, does he ever mention the music, you know? Um, and the answer was, well, it, if I fucking have to. But I mean, any, I've always thought, well, you can buy the music, you can listen to the record. That isn't, what can I give you that you can't get? And what I could give you was getting in the room with these people, seeing them when they had food all over their face and something embarrassing had happened. Um, obviously, there was a serious side to it, but... Um, it, it was just, it, I remember when, I, I don't know if you guys uh, ever in the 90s got Loaded magazine or we that did, kind yeah. of lad culture. Well, James Brown, who, who started Loaded, I mean, he used to be an enormous Kerrang fan. And he used to talk to me about it all the time and used to laugh at it. And so these ideas were kind of a little ahead of their time in that regard, because um, it was completely non-PC at a time when PC was in its infancy. So, you know, enemy, melody maker sounds, these were arbiters of good taste. You know, you, you could feel comfortable and cool being, sitting on a train reading a copy of the enemy, but you wouldn't want to be sitting on a train brandishing Kerrang! magazine with, uh, um, I don't Blackie know. Wallace like on the cover. Yeah, exactly. Carcass and their new album, you know. Um, uh, and it became shameless in that regard. We used to laugh at the others and take the piss. And, um, and as we know, I mean, the old, it, it, it just, uh, it, it's now the longest surviving physical music weekly in the UK, which is yeah. uh, very great. 30, 37 great. years later. Um, and it sounds like you guys just had this sort of creative freedom to just be playful because uh, it wasn't seen as much as a case of say strictly business like mojo like enemy like rolling stone it was this rolling magazine where you, you guys didn't know when this roller coaster would end so let's just enjoy the ride uh so to speak exactly you've absolutely hit, hit the nail on the head i remember someone saying to me at one point you know i realized it'd been five years or something and um it just seemed absurd. I mean, I can remember sitting in LA where I was pretty much domiciled at this point in 89 mm -hmm. Christmas. Um, and, and just kind of saying to people, where is this going? Because it was 89 going into 90 and um, a lot of people were around and, and I, I kept kind of saying, you know, what is the meaning of all this? Because I've got to the stage where, you know, you're at the party so long, eventually you really do want to just go home. Mm. And I'd kind of reached that point, and yet I didn't have a home to go to. Um, and so it was almost like self-fulfilling prophecy when I kind of crashed out of it. Um, you know, people go about Guns and Roses. Again, that was kind of, that was the symptom. It wasn't the cause or the illness. The clash with Axel was just the latest in a, in a long line of me um, not giving a shit um, and making it obvious, you know, that you can not give a shit and have a lot of fun. But when you, when it's, I mean, how long was I? I was about there eight years in the end. And um, I was heartily sick of the whole thing by then. And uh, it started to show, Yeah, you know, uh, the, the interview I did with Axel was, was completely straight up. I mean, he rang me, he asked me to go to his place. It was uh, the early hours of the morning. I recorded everything. I still have the cassettes. Uh, there was a witness. Uh, he even and I we did three different interviews that night. One for the radio show I was doing, and other bits and pieces, and it was all good. Um, but the surrounding, so and then when he blew up about the interview, uh, that was really the 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 kind of excuse to deal with me. What had really been going on was uh, I I I was beyond caring and. 
mm-hmm. I just uh, couldn't get my act together. So I remember there was a group called Little Angels, British group. They kept like a mini Def Leppard and they came to LA and um, I, I spent the day with them, a couple of days with them. I interviewed them. I was going to, I wrote a great story for Kerrang. The only thing I didn't do was the show they did in LA. I didn't go to it because I went out for dinner with David Coverdale instead, but, which at the time seemed much more fun to me than going to some group. I didn't really feel we're going to make it. Um, lovely people. I thought, well, they've had me for two days. I'm writing the fucking story. Why do I need to go and bang my head at the gig, you know, when I could be going out for dinner with David? So um, so there were things like that, and it rubbed people wrong because they weren't in that space. By then, Kerrang! had more people on the staff, people that hadn't been there in the dancing on the desks and drinking 12 bottles of champagne days. They hadn't been there for any of that. They computers had come in, and you know, they, it was a different. Emap had bought the cut the magazine. It was a very different transition, and I just wasn't in that realm. I was in LA by then. I was writing for tons of different magazines. I was doing TV and radio and all this business, mm. and um, and I can't. I, I from their point of view, I'd grown too big for my boots. And yeah. from my point of view, they were all little people that didn't understand, you know. So, um, well, so there you go. So that was so on uh, the um, clash with Axel, Mick. Um, I mean, obviously, you get me back to that. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, I couldn't let you get off the hook that easily. Uh, of, of course, what you're referring to there is that famous interview you did for Kerrang in the early '90s, uh, in which uh, Rose threatened to harm Vince Neil uh, of Motley Crue, of course, after an incident. The actual words him. were. I, I want to smash his plastic face. Yep. Guns or knives, motherfucker. I don't care whichever way you want to go. Yeah. And, and then Vince Neil caught wind of this, came out in the press and said, I'll meet you. I'll fight you anywhere, anytime. And from what I understand, Axel basically never fronted up and claimed that uh, his crew held him back when an opportunity arose backstage at an event to, to fight uh, Vince Neil, um, but well, you nearly you've nearly got it right. Let me okay. let me move this one out. Okay, um, it sparked from the American Music Awards mm-hmm. ceremony where Axel got up and sang with Tom Petty, and Motley Crue were also there getting some award, um, and Izzy was there. And what had happened was Izzy had been fucking. Vince Neal's, was she his wife? I don't know if she was his wife at that point. Is it Sharice? Sharice, the mud wrestler from uh-huh. the Tropicana. <laughs> uh, Good mud wrestler. The, the best. mud wrestler from <laughs> the Tropicana. And um, uh, class, classy act. And um, so Vince had run over. And Vince, this is a tough Mexican street kid in L.A., from East L.A., exactly the kind of dude you do not want to get into a fight with unless you also happen to be a tough Mexican kid from the barrio or you're carrying a gun. Um, so Vince runs over, wallops Izzy, and Axel, you know, runs over to help his best bud in all the world, and um, the bodyguards intervened. Now, Axel, in Izzy's own words to me, was just a little guy. Um, I mean, he had a he had a, a, a big brain and a big voice and a big attitude, but I mean, he was. This is not a fighter, you know. You you could. I mean, tiny, skinny, hunched up little Cosimodo, you know, with red hair. He, this is a guy. One punch, he's going to run away crying. Um, not Vince. So Axel's being held back, you know. And um, and then and then he reads about it in Kerrang, and whatever the report was in Kerrang, it didn't get it quite right. So he rings me up about midnight one night in LA. Get over here! I got something I want to say. Yada yada yada. And so um, when I came to transcribe the interview, 
um, I could see how heavy it looked on the page. I mean, these days, you know, post social media where haters are abundant and we all slag each other off, that didn't exist. You know, to, to have someone in a magazine offering to meet someone and beat the shit out of them. You know, this was uh, a big story. I mean, the national newspapers picked it up here in the UK. The Sun uh, took my interview and ran it as a three-day world exclusive for which I sued them. It took a year, but I got money out of them. Um, I wouldn't repeat the process. It was a complete bad move in terms of time and effort in all the wrong places. But it was a big interview. And as I'm typing this thing up, I'm going to smash that fucker's face, you know, blah, blah, blah. I thought, this looks really heavy. So I rang him and I recorded this conversation as well. And I still have this conversation. And I just said, look, I'm sitting here writing this and it just looks really heavy. Uh, he said, well, read me some. And so I read him some of the worst parts and he was laughing. And then he said, and I quote, he said, I stand by every motherfucking word print it so we did and three days after the magazine came out his publicist called me and told me axel didn't believe he'd said those things and it turned into you can imagine how i took this information um it had just been a few months before that that, that you know they'd been asking me if i would have slash stay at my home in england uh, so he could come off heroin I was going to introduce him to the private doctor that I knew had helped many people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that, that was just wasn't available at that moment in America. It would have meant going into a big rehab treatment center and spending a load of money. Whereas this was much more discreet, a private doctor in London, you know, um, it, there were all kinds of things I never wrote about. There were all kinds of things I still have never written about and won't because they were very personal and um, many things. And so to, to, to be that guy, and they were giving me gold records. With, I've got GNR lies on the wall next to me here right now with my name on it. To, to go from that guy to being, he, he didn't say those things, you made it up. I mean, I lost my fucking mind. Mm -hmm. I then offered to fight him. <laughs> and of course that didn't pan out. Um, didn't but Don did. King uh, want to promote a fight between Axel and Vince and, and Alice did Cooper Don came out and said he'd fight the winner? <laughs> yeah, Don King uh, was my you know, big doc boxing promoter <laughs> from Ali to Tyson and onwards. Yeah. You know, he, he offered to promote the fight and Vince was up for it. Um, but not Axel. I mean, fuck's sake, never in a million years. You know, <laughs> this is the phantom of the opera, you know? Yeah. Well, they probably uh, missed out on a big payday. I mean, nowadays you've got YouTube stars like Logan Paul yeah, fighting yeah. Floyd Mayweather for millions of dollars. No, listen, absolutely. But those guys can fight. Yeah. You know, you have to, you have to remember Vince <laughs> could fight. I mean, he could fucking fight. I, I don't think Axel ever had a fight in his life. He was good. At, he was the guy that would run away, you know? Um, uh, so that was just never, ever going to happen. But, of course, it, it, it blew up. It turned into this thing. And then his publicist did a, did a very shitty thing, really, because she fell out with me because she was crazy about me and I didn't feel the same way. So that went south. Mm -hmm. And she told Mag uh, Karang, she said, um, so they were like, oh, you know, they were desperately trying to get more interviews. Um, and Axel wouldn't at this point. This is where Axel introduces the contracts. This was a big thing when Use Your Illusion came out. Everybody, if you wanted to interview Axel or any of the band, you had to sign a contract um, saying they owned it and they had approval. And of course, it went down like a lead balloon with the music press, particularly in the UK, because that just was not something, you know, fucking Paul McCartney didn't ask for that. You know, I mean, Bowie didn't ask for that. You know, that just mm. didn't fucking happen. And he did it. And of course it, it blew, blew up in his face. Everybody hated him for it. Um, uh, and, and, and thus began this uh, reputation for being the Howard Hughes of rock, you know, the weird guy. So um, the whole thing had endless repercussions, but one of which was 
Kerrang desperately trying to get another Axel interview under pressure from EMAP, who, again, all these people that weren't there dancing on the tables. Um, and the publicist said to Jeff, um, well, you know, I could maybe do something for you with Axel, but, you know, we have a problem. And the problem was me. Mm. So um, I was I was never phoned. I was never spoken to. They just took my name off the masthead, and uh, and that was that. But again, endless sidebars to this. As this is happening, I already decided to leave because I had found, or I believed, with a new Def Leopard, only better. You know, that's that was that was. Um, that was absolutely where I was at that moment. I'd pay, I'd got EMI to invest in some demos. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we did a showcase. They flew me to LA to meet Capitol Records because clearly this was going to be a big American act as well. So, and I turned up in this suite and I've been to LA a million times. I even have an apartment. But on this occasion, they've laid on a suite at a hotel and I turn up with this champagne and flowers in the room and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I thought, here we go. And needless to say, it all came to shit because literally, um, just as I was setting up this deal, a little group from Seattle called Nirvana mm -hmm. had this um, massive hit. And suddenly my new Def Leppard stunk like a 10-day-old corpse and um, I couldn't get them off the ground. Um, yeah. We'd gone from this is this is the most amazing new British act in decades to oh no, you see, you look like Aerosmith. What we need are, are kids Flannel in shirts shirts and mm. yeah. yeah. It kind of went full so, circle. I mean, you were talking about the Sex Pistols <coughs> earlier and them being very anti-institutional, anti-success to the eighties when it was dancing on tabletops, who can have the biggest hair, who can have the biggest spotlight. And then in the nineties, again, it went back to being all anti, anti-institution again. Uh, <clears throat> well, it, um, it certainly did in rock and it became a, a, it was a, it was a time bomb that went off. I mean, it was overnight Motley Crue stopped selling records, mm -hmm. poison, all those groups. Um, and none of them were really built to last. I mean, let, you know, let's be fair. You know, Wasp and Poison and L.A. Guns, th these were fantastic bands for their moment. But, um, you know, we're not talking about Led Zeppelin here or the Rolling Stones or the Who or no. someone. You know, these were, these were here today, gone later today bands that were just amazing fun. Um, and suddenly, for no, through no fault of their own, it flips and suddenly they look completely out of date. They, they look old fashioned. They're from a previous decade. The whole house of cards just collapsed. And um, I mean, even Guns N' Roses, although they survived it, um, the, the years of ridicule had begun. I mean, just as Kurt is going out there in a moth eaten cardigan and a pair of jeans that don't fit him looking like he'd been up for five days on heroin because he had. Um, and here's Axel in an enormous dome uh, with, with a fucking grand piano built into the seat of a pantomime Harley Davidson. I mean, it's just insane. I mean, November Rain, the video, cost like $2 million. Great video, though. Do you, I, see, I, I, I hate that video. Really? I think it's, oh, man. Mate, I love that. It's, Guitar solo where Slash walks out of the church and is in the middle of his <laughs> open field. Fantastic, mate. Iconic you moment. Mean, <laughs> <clears throat> you mean where he's playing guitar on a mountaintop that isn't plugged in? <laughs> That's the there's, exact there's, same word, yes. Yeah, there, there's no visible means of support it's for that. Guitar. Wireless, mate. Wireless. It, no, it's called miming. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, if you compare that to the Sweet Child of Mine video, which really did cost like a hundred dollars to make, you know, the sweet child of mine video is visceral. It's you're in that room. It's fucking feel dark and exciting. And although they're obviously miming in that, they don't look like it. You know, it really looks like they're going for it. Whereas November rain straight out of the fevered 
brain of Axel Rose, um, who Alan Niven, when I was doing the book on them, their manager was telling me Axel would come in with these ideas for videos and then he'd leave the meeting and the video director would say, Alan, that's going to cost you $20 million if you do that video. <laughs> and, um, and so they had to kind of circumnavigate that. But by the time you get to November rain, Alan Niven's been fired. Anybody that ever said to Axel, maybe not such a good idea. Everybody is fired. You know, I'm, I'm in the shit club, which is now bigger than the people that aren't in the shit club. So, um, the Axel Friends Society has dwindled to about two guys and the shit club is everybody else with me as a founding member. Um, so, uh, yeah, so not only that, so this happens, but suddenly Kerrang! isn't special anymore. I mean, number one, they've let me go. Um, I come back a couple of years later when I get back from L.A. and I start writing for a Raw magazine which was a Kerrang offshoot. There's a whole yeah. backstory there. We'll get into that another time. And, um, um, but Kerrang is no longer Kerrang. You know, the days of Kerrang being the only magazine that would put Iron Maiden on the cover, Aussie, Motorhead, Def Leppard, Metallica, Anthrax, Endless. Um, and not at a time when no other fucking magazine would do that. Those days are gone because Enemy... Uh, the Sydney Herald, you know, the London Times, the LA Duda, everybody wants Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, mm -hmm. and all the others. So uh, Rolling Stone, Mojo, Q, everybody, everybody. So um, suddenly, um, Kerrang! is foundering. Uh, Raw is barely clinging on. Um and uh, I turn up in the office in cowboy boots with long hair. And I suddenly, the minute I walked in the room, I was like, oh, fucking hell. I'm like, I'm like back to the future here. You know what I mean? So I, I remember literally going out the next day and buying some Dr. Martin boots and cutting my hair and, and, um, and trying to fit in. You know, we, we were all suddenly looking to fit in. Def Leppard, it was, it was like after punk, Def Leppard cut their hair. Yeah. You know, uh, Bon Jovi and Def Leppard both chose to bring out their greatest hits with a standalone single, which was a ballad, which would guarantee radio play and become a hit. And that, for Bon Jovi, it was always. And, um, and for Def Leppard, it was a song I can't remember the name of, but it was like number one over here. Mm. Um, you know, it was a, everybody, all the confidence and fun had gone. David Lee Roth put it really well. He goes, um, grunge, that was when fun stopped being fun. Um, and it was true. All, all their careers withered on the vine. The magazine withered on the vine. <clears throat> Raw finally went out of business in 95, just as I bought my first house. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um and uh, and Kerrang began its slow descent into mediocrity, and how can we appeal to the broadest possible audience? Which is why, for the last ten or fifteen years in the UK, Kerrang is mainly bought by by teenage girls. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but but you know it, it's got the same name. But the magazine I helped build and turn into something uh, well known. You know, that magazine died years and years ago. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Well, so nowadays, it tends to be the likes of uh, Bring Me the Horizon or Black Veil Brides and whatnot who appeal to the sort of 16-year-old girl rocker market nowadays. Yeah, I, see, I have no idea who that is you just there you mentioned. Go. <laughs> no more than you probably know who Rogue Male were or Rock Goddess or... Um, any of the other crazy lunatics. I do remember Wet Cherry, though, from uh, the Decline uh, documentary. That was, that was a, a band that <laughs> was destined for greatness, if only. <laughs> what were they called? Wet Cherry. Wet Cherry. You see, I would love to have been at that meeting where the guy comes in and goes, guys, I've got it. I've got it. Wait, wait, listen, hey. listen. Ready, 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 ready. Listen, open your minds. Listen, ready. Wet 
cherry. Oh, well, that's <laughs> fucking it, man. The other's like, dude, <laughs> that's awesome. That's the most awesome name of a band ever. Right. It was, right. The, it was the 80s. It was 1985. They were one bottle deep of Jack Daniels and probably several grams deep of cocaine. It made sense. Yeah, of course. Of course it did. <laughs> well, a lot of things do when you're like that. Um, so it was, uh, it, it was, when I look back, it's not so much the depravity. It really isn't. It's the fun I remember and the characters. I mean, um, every group had them, you know, like Poison were not Einstein when it came to music. But Brett Michaels, come on, C.C. DeVille, Ricky, Ricky Rocket. Rocket. And then on bass, the only one without blonde hair. Mm, the mysterious Duff. one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, just this stuff would just tickle the shit out of us for years and years <laughs> and years. I mean, even Metallica were cartoon-like right up to the 90s when they began to take themselves very seriously. But before that, I mean, we used to, Lars was always known as Stars um, because he was so clearly, you know, <laughs> starstruck mm. and on a, on a mission to become famous no matter what. You know, there was, there was Stars, Bon Jokey, um, uh, oh God, I can't remember. You know, loads of these things, like your best friends. You just you just took the piss, made up nicknames, and and thoroughly enjoyed their company. Um, so, so it was a, those are the things I remember. Uh, and and these days, because I'm an old guy, clearly I have no fucking idea what's going on at ground roots level anymore. You just mentioned two groups I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. um, but do, are the where are I mean? I guess one would hope that these groups will produce incredible figures uh, uh, like the ones that oh, inhabited the rock world. They the will. Apes. I mean, I mean, some of the figures you're alluding to. I mean, you mentioned Slash earlier, spending time at your your place in, in London while he was recovering from his heroin addiction. I mean, you look at video games like say guitar hero three for example which was a worldwide hit and that came out a good 25 years after um after use your illusion one and two came out and who do they put on the cover it's not some modern day rock no. god if there is such a thing it's slash they've got to go deep into the archives to find someone recognizable and, and that's perhaps something that's missing nowadays there's big iconic figures who stand the test of time, even 20 or 30 years later, without releasing too much notable content. I agree. And I, I, and I think the other thing is, is there's, because I think there are some, uh, I'll, I'll give you some names of some artists I think are remarkable, uh, young mm -hmm. and new. Um, but there isn't that kind of lineage. There isn't that extra context. You know, almost everybody we covered in the 80s had a, an enormous hinterland, you know, Ozzy was Sabbath, Dio was Sabbath and Rainbow, Lemmy was Motorhead and Hawkwind and everybody else that ever walked the earth, you know, um, Thin Lizzy. All these people had really long backstories and it made them more intriguing to know. Mm. Uh, it was like hanging out with your older brother's cool pals. You were suddenly going to places you'd only read about before. I don't see that right now with the with a, whatever the next generation is. However, that doesn't mean there isn't great music being made. I, I'm just not entirely sure if rock, as we used to know it, um, is in a place where it can be refreshed or reconfigured or represented in a different way. I think it's also ironic and knowing now that People don't even want that. They, they want authenticity. I mean, that's why people like me still have a, a career, an even better career than I ever had on Kerrang, because of the years I spent on Kerrang, because of all the other things I did where I either fell spectacularly on my face or I uh, came out with something amazing like my Led Zeppelin book or my Jimi Hendrix book. Um it, it, Def Leppard and Journey, I remember seeing them on tour in 2018 
in, in America. They were, it was a co-headline. They did every arena and major stadium you can think of. Uh, and they both came away with over $100 million each. You know, they're bigger now than they were back in the day because people want what we used to have. Yeah. Because it's an authentic experience. We've also uh, got multiple the- generations of fans heading out nowadays, like even, even grandparents in some cases taking their grandkids out to see Def Leppard and Iron Maiden and Kiss nowadays. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, De- Def Leppard are now all pushing 60. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, their, their fans are plenty of scope for granddad and grandkids in that. Yep. Um, but uh, I mentioned, okay, a couple of artists, and this, these are people that I find out about through my children, who are all teenagers. Um, Billy Eilish, who everybody knows about at this mm-hmm. point. But two years ago, um, when her first one or two tracks came out and my teenage daughters were playing it to me, I just thought, wow, what is this? Um, just when you thought you'd heard it all in pop music or rock music, along comes this young female artist who isn't going to dress provocatively or like a soft porn video. In fact, deliberately goes the other way. Here's a young artist that writes all her material with her brother. Very unique point of view, unique sound. I mean, it just the whole thing was incredibly intriguing. And I was doing a, a Sunday afternoon radio thing here at the time. In fact, it only ended a couple of months ago. We had a two-year run. And um, I was talking about her all the time, um, ad nauseum. Um, so I'm doing that to display the fact that I, I'm not late to that party. In fact, I was early through my kids. But another one, a boy, Young Blood. I don't know if you know about Young Blood out there in the rest of the world, but it's, it's Young B L U D. I think it's a one word. Mm. This dude, he's English, um, mm. but he mainly in America. Um, fucking talented, crazy motherfucker. He kind of reminds me of what Axel would have been like um, had he not had Guns N' Roses and had he been a bit more self-sufficient and, and, and less Asperger's-y, you know, because Youngblood brings out a new track every two or three weeks mm. and I get to hear about it because, you know, one of my daughters is insanely in love with him. But, I mean, so I've seen his videos, his shows. This fucker is for real. He's got a um, bit of an Axel Rose snarl going on. I'm just looking at some of his images at the moment. So um, it, oh, it's, interesting. Totally. it's interesting what you say there, though, because the nature of music nowadays, I mean, it's not like you need to press a, a CD or vinyl and have that distributed all over the world, and therefore you record 10 tracks once every two years and, and then tour in support of it. You can release a song every, you know, once a month if you want to and just get that out to the world through Spotify. Well, that's exactly what he does and what he's been doing. And I think that's the way, that's absolutely the way to go. Um, I mean, my, I have three children, two daughters and a younger son, and they all love music. Um, but the girls in particular are crazy about music. The eldest one is at university now, and she's at that stage where she's going back and discovering the history of all the great artists. My other daughter is 17 and, and she is all about right now. And everything is on her phone, everything. And um, uh, they know what's going on. They are so cutting edge. And um, to see their excitement, uh, to, I'm always saying to her, her name's Molly, I'm always saying, Molly, who is this? And she'll tell me, I go, say it again. All right, okay, okay. And I, I keep up to date with stuff like that. And I think there is amazing stuff. I mean, Youngblood has what could be, you know, the influences in his music are hip-hop, heavy metal, uh, punk, um, just a raw attitude and a really talented mm. guy. Um, so I think, you know, the, the spirit lives on. It just, uh, it just doesn't look like... A guy in White Snake in 1988, you know. Um, I, I really think those days are gone unless yeah. it's reframed in a kind of an ironic, knowing way, which yeah. is very 
everything is like that now. You don't need that. You want something that isn't like everything. So um, it's interesting what you say that. there about <laughs> um, your daughters being so into into music and and you know always they've got everything on their phones and I perhaps perhaps the whole concept of releasing a song once a month perhaps aligns with the teenage sort of maybe it's not the attention span but the fact that there's so many things vying for the attention of people's uh, minds nowadays that to sit there and listen to say 10 or 12 songs on one album without moving like you would back in the day you know lock yourself in a room pour yourself some jack and and listen to the album nowadays people are reaching for their phone every five minutes so perhaps releasing a song once every four weeks <laughs> is the best way to capture their attention oh no absolutely and, and I think rock bands could learn a lot from this. Mm. Uh, you know, the tragedy of most rock bands is that they make their best music in their 20s and, and from there on in, it's just a case of trying to recapture that lightning, which um, they so rarely do. Yeah. Um, but no, I, 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 I think the culture we live in, you're exactly right. Um, even before streaming on the phone was, was the norm, I can remember when Lady Gaga was first a big star and we'd be playing her music in the car for the kids. And um, I remember saying to one of my daughters, oh, no, what's this one called? Hang on. Sorry, a dog just came in the room. Oh, uh, good. The heavy metal, the heavy, metal pug. heavy metal pug, yes. He's here. And <laughs> I'm saying, what's this one called? And she'd look at me like, she goes, track seven. And I go, yeah, but what's it called? I don't know. You know, go, but you've played it a million times. But mm. uh, and so now they they're much more up with that. They know what things are called. But there's no sense of um, you know, Youngblood is bringing out an album. Billie Eilish does albums, but there's no. It's not the grand event it used to be. It's kind of gone back to where it was in the late '50s, early '60s, where it was all about the single. Mm -hmm. And there will be an album at some point, but it will basically be the singles plus some other bits, you know, and if you want it, you can have it, but it's not the, it's not what drives that artist's profile or career. Um, uh, it's singles. And I think that's where we're at right now. I mean, we call them singles. I mean, that's such an old fashioned term. They're just tracks, yeah. but the kids know about it. The kids are on fire with this stuff because they're all connected with TikTok and everything else, and they all talk to each other. You know, they know what's coming, they're ready for it, and they are on it like motherfuckers, mm -hmm. because they don't have to wait for the shop to open, they don't have to borrow the money from their parents. They just uh, click, and there it is. So, um, personally, I like that. I, I, you know, I think there were too many terrible albums made. Um, uh, for, for the sake uh, of fulfilling cool. um, contractual obligations with record companies. Absolutely. Or just straight out stealing. You know, I mean, mm. they talked about, oh, when people were stealing music. How about all the fucking years when they were sticking out these shitty 16 track CDs with 72 minutes of music, only 10 of which was any good, and yeah. charging 15 quid a pop? I mean, the, the whole, it was rape and. Um, thievery um so yes yeah, so there was a bit of payback in the early 2000s um and it's still a tricky area we're transitioning i mean books are which is my field you know they've they're they're, they're definitely been hit very in a similar way to the music business slightly less so because it's a different audience it's a bigger audience it's a different experience mm -hmm. enjoying a book there is a bit um, of a, a return to form with books. I find that people now spending so much time staring at screens, they actually yearn to disconnect for 30 minutes or an hour or so and, and bury their head in a book. Well, I hope that's true. Um, mm. I hope that's true. I mean, uh, America, you know, the kind of consensus culture um, is really not at all book driven at all. Um, I, I have many, many really smart, intelligent friends in America, mm -hmm. uh, and very few of them ever crack open a book. Um, I think that's partly the American culture, um, but at the same time uh, bothers me because you're quite right. I mean, I, 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 you know, I've got a Kindle. I've got all the same devices everybody else has got. 
But I, the novelty wore off real quick. Uh, and if you, my favorite reading experience is I buy a lot of secondhand books, is to crack open a book that's clearly very old. Mm. You can smell how old it is. You can feel how old it is. And, and for me, that absolutely adds to my uh, experience as a reader. Um, uh, it's tactile. You know, the whole thing for me is lovely. And you put it on the shelf. It's analog, you know, this it's is, organic. Uh, it's organic and uh, <laughs> and also if you, you know, you're reading you go oh you feel like you missed something you go back a couple of pages and you go oh okay yeah. i found that infuriating on kindle trying to you know go back a page or two and, and then back where was i and oh you know just i find that much more bothersome than this beautiful technology that has existed for hundreds of years mm -hmm. uh, called a book so yeah 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 so i mean speaking of writing books and speaking of writing for kerrang i mean nowadays people are seeking out authenticity when it comes to their music now the the mainstream charts don't always attest to that but that's generally what people have, have sought after since the turn of the 80s into the 90s and, and something that perhaps differentiated you from a lot of other rock writers was that authenticity the fact that you would call it as you saw it uh you were polarizing and this resulted in you oftentimes winning both i believe it was the most loved and the most hated or, or the best and the worst writer at kerrang magazine for like years on end well it would be the uh, best thing about kerrang yeah worst thing about kerrang. <laughs> uh, and one one year i won both of those simultaneously yeah um uh, and, you know, how do you take that? And the editor was like, well, you take that as the ultimate compliment. You know, the the, the worst thing anybody can ever say about a writer is, oh, he's, he's all right. Yeah. Did you yeah. like that story? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Did, what did you think of that story? I hated it. I hate that guy. That fucking guy. I hate him. Yeah. It's what did you think of the 1K or 5Ks. Absolutely. What do you think of that story? Oh, I, love, I love it. Love it. Best thing I've read in ages. You know, that's where you want to be. But by the time I, I, mean, I wrote my first books back in the uh, very late 80s, early 90s. But the I don't really feel I became a proper book writer till the 2000s. Mm -hmm. And... Um, because things change, you know, back, back in the 80s, 90s, you got nothing for writing books. And, and so you wrote them as if they were nothing because you weren't getting paid hardly anything. And it was almost a vanity thing. Um, things change around about 2004 for me um, because of a book I wrote called Paranoid, which was a lot of fiction, a lot of reality a lot mm -hmm. of i don't know what this is i'm just going to write this thing that's ghastly and entertaining and weird and off the back of that um i got approached by a literary agent and suddenly uh, i i'm in a different realm in terms of how much money someone will pay me to write a book and it meant i could spend more time and take them seriously and if someone gives you a serious amount of money to do something you you take it, well, I don't know about everybody else, but me, I take it fucking seriously. I, the more money I get, the more serious I take something. And so um, at that point, <clears throat> I developed a completely different attitude to writing. And I had to make some tough choices. Do I preserve these relationships I have with artists and people in the business? Or do I just go for broke? and try and write, you know, at the time, just one book at a time. Every book could be your last, you know. So I just put everything into this and, and just see where it takes me? And that's what I did. And sure enough, it meant, you know, Jimmy Page stopped talking to me. James Hetfield stopped talking to me. Um, other examples. Um, but at the same time, there were lots of people that now desperately wanted to talk to me um, because they'd read the books and they had a completely different idea of who I was at that point. And so that's been my formula ever since, which is 
to not try and deliberately burn bridges, but um, uh, uh, where, where it has to be done, it has to be done. And, and I just hope and pray that, that the work will be good enough that it will, uh, it will develop a new bridge to some other place rather than um, wanting to, oh, I hope, I hope, you know, I hope the guys in Bon Jovi still like me, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't give a fuck. I mean, it'd be, it's nice when we meet, but it, I don't lie awake at night worrying about that shit. I mean, I used to be at gigs every night for years and years and years all over the world. Uh, and I don't do that anymore. I haven't done it for a long time. I'm too busy writing books and trying to find the truth, um, which is a lot of fun, but does require a kind of monastic dedication and, and absolute discipline about not giving a shit who it might offend. Um, yeah. And, and readers respond to that. People are not... A lot of people are stupid, but there are many people that aren't stupid. They see, they know. I mean, the less authenticity there is, the more attuned people are to it when it shows up. And um, um, that's genuinely the response I get, not just to my books, but podcasts, TV and radio stuff, uh, live shows that I do. People love um, the truth. Uh, and sometimes the truth makes me look like a complete fucking idiot <laughs> because I was at that moment or can still be quite often. Um, but they then believe you when you tell them the other stuff because it's all coming from the same place. And that's what's interesting um, to get, you know, to try and share that, that stuff. And I'm the same way. I'm the same way. I, I read books and listen to podcasts and, watch TV and all that stuff. And uh, it's always clear as day when someone has something and they are brave enough to um, let it hang out and skillful enough to present it in a way that, that hopefully will turn you on. So um, definitely. So, I mean, you've published or written more than 20 books and some of these books are absolute monsters. I mean, when giants walk the earth, uh, the 50 years of Led Zeppelin book. I mean, that's what I haven't got the book right in front of me right now, but from memory, it's over 600 pages. Um, same as your Metallica book. That was about 500 pages long. So obviously this requires a lot of dedication to your craft. And these are well-written books with a lot of humor and interesting anecdotes and all the rest of it. Um, do you think you could have written a book like When Giants Walk the Earth in 1985, Mick, when you were uh, turning up to the office with six beers in, in tow? Not in a million years. <laughs> I, could, I, I could barely write it in 2007 and 2008 when I did write it. I mean, I, I, I had... How long did it take you to write a book like that? Led Zeppelin took me about nine months, mm -hmm. and that was pretty much working on just that and nothing else. I, I did take the occasional gig here and there, just a one-off thing here and there, um, only because it looked easy and there was money. But there were maybe two or three of those in the whole nine months. I mean, the rest of it was all Zeppelin. My, my children were all babies at the time. Uh, my boy was two. My girls were seven and four, five. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up renting <clears throat> a little place about 10 minutes drive away, um, like a little cottage, uh, where I just, that was, that was me for six months, uh, just working on the Led Zeppelin book. And I, every step of the way, I was terrified because they had given me a shitload of money to do it. And... I it, I froze. I froze. I was terrified. I'd never seen that much money. And um, I just, uh, I remember talking to John Houghton, who I now do the Get Your Rocks Off podcast with. Mm -hmm. um, I remember talking to John on the phone and saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. And he was like, why not? <laughs> I'm like, what do you fucking mean, why not? He said, you're Mick Wall, aren't you? You're like the guy. You can write anything. And that made me so mad because I thought, oh, don't blow me off like that. I'm really struggling here. But 
it did make me just half the job is just sitting down, turn up at the desk and sit down and then, and then, you know, go for it. Um, and a lot of days it doesn't work. Nine hours go by and you've written a page, you know, and it's not even a very good page. I mean, that can happen all the time. Um, but that took nine months and a lot of sweat. I, I'd have nightmares. I had one nightmare where Jimmy Page was sending me a curse. Um, a, few, a few dreams like that, actually. But, I mean, I, I broke my ass. I did everything I possibly could to make that book good. And, um, and it was. I mean, you know, uh, it's a fantastic book. The, the one you're talking about, The 50 Years, that was... Um, uh, the original book came out in 2008, and in 2018 was the 50th anniversary of them making their, recording their first album. Mm -hmm. So in that, I, I, I wrote a, a, a kind of an update that covered those 10 years, but not just those 10 years. Uh, since uh, uh, from the original book, quite a few people that I'd approached to interview for that book. Um, hadn't you know had said no for various reasons and then had read the book subsequently and now really wanted to be in the mm. update because it it just was a huge success and so it wasn't just bringing it up to date i i could i was able to go back and you know i interviewed all the yard birds you know i had uh phil carson who'd been the president of atlantic records uh, outside america who was personally responsible for zeppelin Jason Bonham, uh, loads and loads of people that, that didn't speak to me for the first book now spoke to me for the second book. So the, the, the updated one has about 40,000 extra words that the first one didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the total wordage is about 250,000 words, which is about uh, that, that's enough, that's two, enough for three, three and, books. and a half books. <laughs> <laughs> Huge. Well, um, my, my last book was a 70,000 word book for Wiley. So that's a good three and a half. So I can't imagine writing a 250,000 word book, a quarter of a million word book. But um, I mean, I loved what you talked through a moment ago as well, Mick, about sitting there, you've got this big pile of money, you're not sure you wanted to do it. You had that chat with John, kind of takes me back to part one of our conversation and you writing for Sounds Magazine and just having that do or die attitude perhaps this time admittedly it was wasn't so much do or die but once you decided to do it it was do or die it just took you a little while to get there oh completely um it, it's always been do or die i think that was just one of those very rare occasions where i felt fairly sure it, it was going to be die um <laughs> uh uh and I, I bitched all the way through it. I mean, about five months in, I was begging my agent to say to the publishers, it's going to be two volumes, you know. So, so I thought, well, at least if I give them, you know, I've written enough that I could give them enough for a book if it was a first volume of two. And then I can be out of this hell for a few months and finish the second one next year, you know. Um, and they weren't having it, just not having it. We've given you a ton of money. This is the deal. Deliver the book. Um, but, hey, you know, you learn. I mean, um, I've written about 15 books since then. And I mean, you said earlier over 20. It's actually more like over 40 because I've written books under different names. I've written mm -hmm. books that I don't even have a copy of and have never even seen, you know, for weird publishers in Canada or America or Japan, you know. Um, uh, but, um, you, you know, these days, you know, my, my most recent book on Jimi Hendrix, that's less than a hundred thousand words long. And for me, it's by far the best book I've ever written. Um, but it's, that's from my entirely from my point of view. And because with Hendrix, I really felt that, that this was like the Christ story, you know, this kind of mythological being that appeared amongst the disciples and was considered the son of God. 
mm. and then died a horrible death, which, in my view, had nothing to do with an accidental overdose, but was, in fact, a murder. Um, so I, I, I thought, well, you know, we, we, you know, we all think we know the broad outline of the Christ story, but you can interpret it and add to it and bring it to life in a way that people had never considered before. And so that's what I tried to do with Hendrix. It was, I already know I'm a great writer of this kind of stuff, but where can I take this where I haven't been before as a writer? And, um, and so that's what I did with Hendrix. And I got to tell you, man, I, I, it was a thrilling thing to do. It was very hard and, and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, the publishers had a lot of problems with it, uh, which is almost resulted in me never working with them again um, because they wanted some, something much more vanilla and just told the same fucking story that millions of other books have told. And um, so I, I, you know, I, I th there's a, there's a, a um, there's a relationship I have now with the people that read my stuff or listen to my stuff where I think they trust me to do right by them. Even if they don't always like the finished product, I think they will at least, they acknowledge at least that I'm trying to do something exceptional. Um, and I'm doing it for all of us, you know? Uh, and I'm doing it about artists and music that, that so many of us are in, still intrigued by and in love with. Mm. Definitely. And um, I mean, we're, we're getting close to the uh, tail end of this conversation. And um, one thing, I mean, we probably don't have time to talk about your producing documentaries at Sky or BBC Radio or founding, co-founding Classic Rock magazine or being a founding editor back in 1997. But Perhaps a good place to wrap up the Mick Wall story would be on some sort of, say, revelations you've had about life. Um, perhaps we can we can touch on death, but firstly about the empty existence that can be or or was rock and roll in the eighties. Um, and, and I believe you penned this elsewhere, where you basically said that you know, despite having access to so much sex, drugs, um, and so on you eventually saw how fake and empty the existence was for most, if not all of the bands you covered um, and how that also applied to your own life. And like you said, you mentioned now you've got a young family, you're married, you're, you're living um, in the relatively uh, peaceful surrounds of Oxfordshire. Um, I mean, what have you learned about that? And what are you doing differently nowadays? Obviously the heroin's gone, the hard driving lifestyle's gone, but now that you're 62, you've been in this game for four decades. I mean, what are some of the really sort of profound life lessons that you have learned along that way? Hmm. Um, I don't know um, if that's the sort of thing I can really nutshell. Mm -hmm. um, well, what about the empty of existence and how you've pulled it? I mean, what did it take for you to realize that the, the existence uh was empty and how have you uh transformed yourself sh sh shall we say in like for lack of a better word i don't know steve I, I i um i think it's an ongoing it's an ongoing mission i mean yeah. the whole hard drugs thing ended for me nearly 40 years ago and um there was a period after that and before Kerrang where um, I really didn't feel I'd ever go back to writing about music. I desperately didn't want to. Mm -hmm. I tried everything not to. And I would try again in the 90s. But I, the thing is, I'm just supremely unqualified to do anything mm -hmm. else. The only other jobs I was able to muster up, you know, were, were low paying gigs. Um, and uh, not only was that boring and difficult, but I just felt wasn't really using 
the best of me. I knew I knew I had the, a certain talent in certain areas. I, I mean, I basically know nothing about 75% of life um, or, or I know enough about it to know I'm no fucking good at it. The bit, things I am good at are writing and, mm -hmm. and talking and, and performing and that kind of stuff. And listening. I think you have to be a fantastic listener before you can open your own mouth in the same way that, you know, I read hundreds of books to every one that I write um, because that's where the real pleasure is for me. I think the, the whole kind of emptiness thing is, is a constant battle. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I, for me, those kind of rock years I, was when I kind of, I, 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 I took a sidestep. I just went, you know what? I'm not, I'm not figuring this out very well at all. So what I'm going to do, I mean, I didn't say this, but that's what I feel looking back is I'm going to just allow myself to be diverted and distracted into this weird thing that has, I bumped into accidentally, which means I'm on a plane going somewhere more interesting than sitting at home doing a boring job. It, it was as basic as that. But then as the years went by and the years went by, <laughs> there came a moment in my 30s where I thought, is this it? This, I didn't sign up to make this a lifetime mission. It was just a diversion to get me out of a bad place in my life. Um, so um, th there were a lot of years in the 90s and early 2000s when I, I really shunned that part of my life. And then suddenly I kind of embraced it. I think after Led Zeppelin, I embraced the fact that that's who, you know, Mick Wall, the writer, is to most people. Mm. And so um, let's make the most of it, but let's, let's, not, let's not do it 100%. Uh, just for fun and for kicks and for thrills and for laughs. Let's see if I can bring something to this that, that isn't empty and shallow. And I think that's the answer. I think people like Get Your Rocks Off, the podcast, because uh, it's fun and you learn things you didn't know. But I think what people really respond to is heart. They, they like it. They, they know there is some heart in there. You know, the, 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 my family are Irish and the people that tell the best Irish jokes are Irish. You know, the, the best people to tell Jewish jokes are Jewish comedians. They just, yeah, we know this stuff inside out. We are the ones that can, can make funny. And that's how it is with rock and metal. I think that's how it is in the current world where, thank God, if you like ACDC, that means you can't like Billie Eilish. You know, thankfully, I think we've gone way past that. Mm. Uh, and, and, uh, and while we're all stuck in our own silos, um, I do think, I do think it, it, there's a, a new way of blending realities so that um, people are more accommodating, hopefully, of the fact that life is just fucking weird for everybody. And it's like that alcoholic thing of one day at a time, you know. I, I find at my age, the same shit is still happening to me that ever happened to me. Whenever I think things are going good, you just know <laughs> that the very next moment you're going to get hit over the head by a mallet. Um, but, you know, you, you, that's what makes you interesting. That's what, you know, that's brings life. the laugh. That's the, mm -hmm. that, what's the note of recognition that um, you know, nobody's impervious and anybody that acts like they are definitely deserves the piss taken. Um, and also that, you know, just, uh, I don't want to say rebellious, but free, a questioning free spirit. So that, um, you know, when you know you don't know everything, it means, it means you can learn something all the time. And, you know, that's the key really is those small moments that make up uh, real joy yeah yeah as uh, socrates said uh the more you know the more you know that you know nothing and that beginner's mindset ultimately opens you up to to new experiences and uh new ways of looking at the world and um one one last question to put a close to the the mick wall story mick um you were quoted as saying that you don't want to be the guy with the hammer anymore 
life really is too short as Lemmy and David Bowie proved. What did you mean by that? Well, um, I had a, a long period, you know, I mentioned the book Paranoid. That was bringing the hammer down. Yeah. My biography of Axel Rose in 2007, that was bringing the hammer down. Um, I really believe life was a bucket of shit and that if you didn't start from that standpoint, you really didn't get it. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, I, I have children. I have a, a much a deeper appreciation of life now. And uh, I certainly don't believe life is a bucket of shit. I believe the opposite. Mm. Um, I think we can shit in the pot of life. And I think life um, is a yin yang, sun, moon, night, day, good, bad. You know, you've got you to gotta take it all the same way. Um, and I think what I was trying to say with that is I, I'm not this young, angry guy anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm not saying the anger is gone. The youth has gone, but that doesn't mean the search has gone. It doesn't mean their desire to go and do something brand new today. This day has gone. Um, I, I just don't have any uh, points to prove in terms of, telling the kids Santa Claus isn't real. Um, I've done that. I think we're past that. I think what else can you show me? And, um, um, and right now, as I talk to you, I'm looking out. I live on a house on a farm, not my farm, but it affords me this wonderful view over what's known as the Thames Valley. And um, you can't look at that and feel that life is a bucket of shit, you know, because it clearly isn't. It has been, it is for a lot of people, and it has been for me, and it will continue to be on those terrible days that always come around. But um, I do believe in hope, and I do believe that, um, I do believe in karma. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think it's a silver bullet. I don't think there's a one size fits all solution to anything, but I do believe um, that good things come around, you know, the, the bad things come around without any help whatsoever. Um, but the good things take a little bit more of a nudge and, and that's kind of where to go. Well, that's a beautiful place to end this conversation, Mick. This has been an absolute treat, and I'm sure our <laughs> listeners will enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, of course, you still have desire to go out and do great things in the world, but right now you're working on a little podcast called Get Your Rocks Off, and if people want to deep dive into all of those crazy stories from the Kerrang days, even beyond the Kerrang days, going back into the 70s, and who knows, maybe even the 60s and, and, and parts of the 90s, you know where to find us. Here we are at Get Your Rocks Off. And of course, if they want to deep dive into some of your books, if they haven't read your extensive catalog, they can find them all at amazon.com. Mick, thank you so much. My pleasure, Steve. Always great to speak to you. If you liked this episode, be sure to leave us a review, share it with a friend, or plain old subscribe wherever you happen to listen to it. For full episode show notes, visit nofilter.media forward slash get your rocks off. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.